about is um, some are happy to speak into mics for the sake of the, the live feed, but others have said having to speak into a mic is a little intimidating and might stifle <laughs> involvement in discussion a little bit. So um, I just want to say if you feel free to speak into a mic, go ahead. If you'd rather not, just um, make sure you speak up so everybody in the semicircle can hear. Um, but uh, if we have to repeat something for the for for the live feed, we can do that too. But I think the main thing here is that everybody um, feels as m most comfortable um, to jump right into the to the discussion. So, all right, fair enough. And uh, the great thing about this, we can try it. And if we if we try it and we say this isn't working, well, then we can move on to something else. All right, let me pull up my uh, presenter view here. Okay, so we are in question and answer 10 for the Westminster Shorter Catechism. And uh, we, we kind of worked through line by line last week, but let's, uh, let's take some time just to read this Q&A again. Tyler, if you could advance to the next slide. And, um, I said, and then we're going to just really just dig into what makes a human human in the image of God? What... What are some things that set us apart from the other creatures? Uh, at the same time, it's good to explore what are some things that we have in common with other creatures? That's kind of a fun question to explore. And then, of course, uh, what makes us look like God? If to be in the image of God is to look like God and to represent God, uh, we, want to, we want to talk about that together. So let's uh, start with saying the, I'll ask the question, and we will read this answer together once again. How did God create man? God created man, male and female, after his own image, in knowledge, righteousness, and holiness, with dominion over the creatures. Amen. You know, it's really important, if we are going to have a sense of, of purpose and meaning in life, the core question we have to answer is, who am I? Identity, 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 and creation as created, as fallen, but also as redeemed in Christ in what God has in store for us. That, that's all like a, ch a chain. That's like a, you know, the engine is creation and the rest follows. So getting this right is extremely important. Um, but let's have a little fun with this. Um, think of, pick, pick a creature in your mind, a non-human creature, and think about all the similarities and differences you can think of. If you want to compare, let's say, human beings to cows or to apes or pick a creature, what are the similarities um, and what are the differences? And then we're going to kind of distill that into what makes a human being different from every other creature on earth, just practically as we observe humans. Floor is yours. Talk about this. I have a really specific example. So, uh, as you all know, my parents are gone this week, and Titus always gets very stressed when they leave. He's very anxious. And so is our dog. Our dog refuses to eat when my parents are gone. Interesting. She, honestly, she saw my dad drag, dragging the, the luggage out, and she was like, you could just tell. She vomited up all her food and was like, put her tail between her legs. She was so mad. She knew they were leaving. And it's just funny how anxiety in our dog and in Titus are the same. <laughs> <laughs> so creatures can be anxious too. I love it. Yep. Other creatures other than humans. Okay. So we do see similarities. The same creator, right? Uh, anybody else? Similarities or differences between humans and other creatures? Yeah, it's really interesting how, I mean, what we just saw with the elephants. I didn't know that about grieving. It's very sad, right? And even how they grieve humans. Um, 
of course, you see grief in other animals too, right? But so there is a rudimentary kind of relationship with, with animals as well, but not to the degree uh, that we see in human beings. And particularly, you mentioned uh, knowing God, which requires a soul, right? Which requires a, a non-human spiritual component to who we are. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, um, anybody else to this? Similarities or differences? Elaine? The, this past week, we um, had to put our 15-year-old dog down right? to sleep. She was old, seizures, it was time. And um, as when we got to the vet, and Patrick held her in his arms until she passed. And then just the reality of, yep, she passed peacefully. She gave us many good years, but she had no soul. Mm -hmm. And I think... God made us in his image and we are we are his his children, you know. So yeah. that difference really um impacted me this mm. week. Mm. Thanks for sharing that. Yeah. What else? Similarities and what sets us apart? Yes, we can read. <laughs> Right? <laughs> but that is absolutely vital, right? And that's just the tip of the iceberg, right? This, this is just a really basic observation. Yes, we can read. Nobody else has mastered that, at least not reading with comprehension. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Tyler. <laughs> That's good. I love it. I love it. Although sometimes if you read, if you remember Gary Larson in the far side, you'd see cows standing on their hind legs in the, uh, in the pasture having conversations. And then when the car came, cars came, they would drop on their four legs. But I think that's mythical. Yes. Very good. We can, we can, we are, um, philosophers have talked about this as being self-conscious. We are the only creature that we are conscious of being a distinct self in distinction from others and being able I, that I am me and you are you and we can relate in that way. Yeah, being, uh, being self-conscious uh, self creatures, not self-conscious as in I'm afraid, but self conscious of ourselves as a self. Yep. We can handle large numbers. Some animals can handle small numbers. They've been known to be able to count mm. one, two, three, but mm -hmm. they generally run short after a while. So Seth, the mathematician among us. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Very good. It is true. That's, yeah. Anybody else? Ah, yes. And never seen a dog blush. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and, and blushing is connected to something in terms of a, a moral compass and conscience. Animals live by instinct. We have a deeply innate sense of what is right and wrong, which um, um, can make us pursue goodness, but can also make us evil. Animals aren't evil, they just live by instinct we can actually be evil. Yes, absolutely. So that our moral compass are made in the image of God includes righteousness. The distortion of righteousness is twistedness and evil. Very good. Yeah. Anybody else? Randy. We can enjoy music and animals, you know, don't get it. <laughs> right? Right? Uh, may, maybe less than we can, right? And we can, whoops. And we can create music as well, right? We can take pitches, uh, birds can sing, but we can take pitches, um, arrange pitches into full songs, create instruments, and use our voices to come together and sing those songs. Yeah. And then enjoy it as well. Very, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. So in other words, taking, taking something God created, raw materials, and putting it together, creating something from it 
creating culture, music, art, other things from it. Yeah. We design many complicated structures. We're having a popping issues here. <laughs> you got it. We can design complicated structures, buildings of all sorts. Animals can sometimes build their own nest mm -hmm. or living quarters, but they don't go much beyond that. Interesting, right? How even uh, I didn't know about those birds, those complicated structures that birds build, what beavers build. Pretty marvelous. But we don't see generations of beavers. Yeah, the, weaver bird. the weaver bird, thank you. Yes, I had forgotten. Beavers and weavers. <laughs> so, um, but you don't see generations of weaver birds and generations of beavers building upon the knowledge accrued from the last generation to build two story beaver dams and three story beaver dams, right? Etc. Exactly. I've never seen a crew of frogs with hard hats on on a construction project. Yes. I forget what kind of bird it is, but there were birds that we saw somewhere on a trip where the female judges whether the male has built a sufficiently lovely house. Uh -huh. And if he doesn't, she has to take it or he takes it all down again and starts all over. So some of them are pretty funny. That is really fun. I did not know that. <laughs> That's the similarity. That's good. I like that. <laughs> yep. <laughs> About nine years ago, we had two pug sisters, okay? And um, one of them passed away suddenly. And the other one, every day, she would wake up and wander through the whole house running and crying, weeping at the loss Aww. of her sister. And I never, I never knew animals could grieve like yeah. that. And um, yeah, it broke my heart yeah. to see her in such pain. But uh. anyway. Yeah. It's kind of beautiful how even you can, I think you can see sort of, in terms of the complexity of the creatures, you can see a gradation leading to humans almost. We're still set apart and different, but the more complex the creature, particularly mammals, the more we can see similarities, right? And there's something really cool about that in terms of how, how our God of order um, you know, we see the coherence of creation, but there are things we share with the creatures. We don't often talk about that, but that, that's kind of cool, actually, I think, right? Even as it also highlights how we're very different. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. That's right. Other than some weird and rare creatures that don't, <laughs> um, male and female, right? and reproduction. Yeah. One other thing, I was listening to a podcast and they pointed out that we all have the breath of life. Like mm. obviously we all breathe, but if you look back in Genesis, like creatures are described as having the breath of life also. Absolutely. You even think of the term animal, which comes from anima, which is soul or life, soul, but breath, life. Yeah. I saw somewhere a photo of a pack of wolves and I don't know if this is true or not, but um, in the photo, it, it specified which wolves were which of the pack, and the strongest, some of the strongest, lead the pack. And then in the middle, you have some of the middle of the pack, and then towards the end, you have the very the weakest, but the very last wolf is the strongest of the pack mm. in the back. So there's like an instinct, like for them, it's instinctual, probably not logical as, as we are, but like uh, we have to take care of those who need more accommodation at the back, and we want the strongest at the front, but not the very strongest. Just interesting. I love that, where you get these, these animal organized societies almost. And you know, you, when you talk about that, it makes me think of go to the ant, you sluggard. Proverbs points us sometimes to the creatures for positive examples. And it seems kind of cool to me. And, and Gordon Wilson does this. If you watch more of Ride in the Dance, he talks about how when we look at the cre creation, we can look at certain positive traits that we want to see in humanity in the animal kingdom, 
but then we can also look and we can see distor- you know we can also see kind of a mirror of distortion and fallenness it's so fascinating to me how um it, it's, it's the animal kingdom can in a sense function as a general revelation mirror uh both good and bad um for something that things that are more specifically laid out in scripture and i love that i just love that yeah and so the wolves just made me think of that yeah what else tyler Yeah. Yeah, but where there is that that uh, that that vision, and, and 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 even when you look historically at cultures, yeah, cultures have gone, but there are at least there is a every culture has some sort of ethic for marriage embedded somewhere even if it's a twisted ethic it's a real ethic yeah yeah very good anybody else i'm thinking of like um big apes like they have a somewhat of a system of government where the very strongest male is the leader of the pack and then it goes down from there and if that male can be beaten by another male then that new male is now the leader of the pack Mm. And I think that we're a little more sophisticated than that, but sometimes you see that coming through every once in a while, where it's just the loudest person or the best looking person or the strongest person who ends up king of the hill. That's sometimes our fallen instinct, I think. I love that. And that's an example of how we kind of look in the mirror and we say, oh, are we like that sometimes? That's not right. <laughs> And hopefully it's not like that in the new creation when the lion is laying down, when the alpha male is laying down with the lamb, right? Yep, that's good. One thing I, I know for sure is I have, uh, as we, as we kind of come with our vehicles from different places and different zip codes and converge on this spot on a Sunday morning, I never see frogs doing the same thing, going to their places of worship. Just saying. Maybe you've seen them. I have not. So, Florence? Well, the one thing I think that, that's obviously or is different is that all human beings are created in God's image. No animal is. As, as beautiful and, and amazing as they yep. are, they are not made in God's image. And that's so right. I think today there are people who are so enamored with the creation, in a sense, yeah. that they... They don't think there ought to be any difference between human beings and, and animals in terms of value. Right. And I think that overlooks what Scripture teaches, that human beings are uh, created in God's image and therefore can use language and numbers yeah. and whatever in ways that no animal can. Amen. And I think that gets back to the, the idea that as soon as we get away from identity, that, that core element of our identity, um, if we really are to live out of an ethic that says what you're saying, we're not going to end up with a very pretty world. Yeah. Um, in terms of how we do human life. Yeah. If we are consistent, thankfully our culture doesn't consistently follow that ethic or that move from that, to, that, um, that assumption to, that, to the ethics that follow. But if we did, it would be pretty ugly. Yeah. Very good. Well, this is kind of fun to just to think about and discuss because it not only gets us thinking about human beings, but just thinking about just the diversity of the created order. And what does it mean that God put us as his representative rulers? We talked about that last week, how an image was the king, right? The king would be in a far off capital. And so day by day, his subjects in his vast Re in his vast regime don't see him right we don't have social media we don't have screens we don't have jets we have either foot or horse and so what does he do he erects statues around his realm to represent and remind everybody i'm the ruler here that's what god does we are those images but living images to represent his will his purpose his character all those things so we're going to kind of grapple with that a little bit. Um, 
what I've done is uh, just a different angle on it is uh, six C's, the six C's of God's image. You can come up with your own A's, P's, B's, whatever, right? You may, you may, you might, you know, slice this pie in a different way. I've just tried to come up with, um, to think about this issue biblically, six C's of what it looks like to, for us to be in the image of God. Uh, communion, closely related to that, of course, is communication. We've kind of touched on some of these things already. Character, crown, creativity, and cultivation, right? Some of these overlap, but let's, uh, let's just take some time diving in and, and discussing these together. Let's start with communion. Tyler, if you could take us to um, the communion slide. And um, just, 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 think about, just think about human life. Um, communion is a word we use. Uh, what is it? Uh, maybe not define it. Describe communion. When describe describe a time when you walked away satisfied in communion. Describe it. What is communion? What does it feel like? What does it look like? Yes when you have had real communication that was not superficial and it was profitable. There's been an interchange that's been life-giving. Yeah? That's communion. Amen. That's right. You used a great word, the word bond. And then the concept that you can pick up where you left off. You can build on what's already there. Yeah, I love it. It's good. What else? How would you describe communion? The conversation is so rich that after the clay plates have been cleared and there's nothing else on the table. Everyone is still seated and discussing and talking with each other. Love it. And there's like a rightness of relationship that you don't have to be doing something to enjoy each other's company. Perfect. Enjoying each other's company after the tables are cleared. Not, I got my food, I'm out of here. Mm -hmm. Communion. Describe communion. Anybody else? Josh always talks about um, the joy of going to like a Cubs game and someone hits a home run or whatever and <laughs> everyone scores um, or they everyone cheers. And I think we've talked about being in total agreement with a mm. group of community, like a community where you're all like, yes, this is right and this is good. And like, think of worship in the morning on Sundays and everyone's like in agreement about something or our mock trial team won some awards yesterday and we were all like, yes, Love together. It. In my mind, that's communion. Communion is yes, together. Yep. It's good. There's something bigger than us outside of us that unites us that we agree upon. What else is communion? Describe communion. Feelings as well as thoughts. Yeah. You, know, you, you express your, your ideas, maybe in a group of some kind, but you also have your feelings that you are willing to demonstrate and you're interested in how other people not only think but also feel about it. That way you can understand each, begin to really understand each other, appreciate what other people are thinking and feeling, and so you can then fight out, I disagree, you know, and yeah. go with that. Uh, but yeah, it, there's a, a way of revealing your own thinking and your own feeling. I like that because... Communion, if, if communion is to be a bond, it's going to involve the whole person, right? Um, communion with our thought, communion also with our feelings and our wills. And 
you also brought up, you know, sometimes we disagree, and then with communion, the commitment to the bond is greater than, than uh, goes deeper than the disagreement, or at least that's our heart, that's our desire, is to work through the disagreements in order to maintain and deepen the bond. At least that's what it should be. <laughs> and, um, yeah. Yep. And as we, as, as, we, as we listen to these great comments, we, we can think horizontally, and then in our minds, we can apply them vertically as well. Right? We can apply them vertically as well um, in, our, in our fellowship or communion with God. Yes. God created us with the capacity for communion. How does our capacity for communion, how does that look like God's? If you were to describe God's capacity for communion, how would you describe it? Yes. God, you, you, you mentioned also the concept of understanding. God is open to be known, and he knows us. So being understood by another and understanding another, knowing and being known is a key component of communion, and we see that with our God. He's open to us. Yeah. And our triune God, they, the, the three persons of the triune God commune with each other. Yes. And then they also commune with, with us. Yes. Uh, cre mere creatures, but they do. And, and I think then, uh, like in church, when we're singing a beautiful hymn together, we're communing with the Lord himself, but also with each other about uh, the, whatever ideas and uh, feelings we are expressing. Yes. And so you see that Trinitarian monotheism is really the only way to account for communion being at the heart of who God is also in within himself but also in relationship with us and in our life together yeah yeah very good can somebody um I should have brought out some bibles that I did not can somebody if you have a phone that works too thank you Monica uh can somebody read for us John 17 verse 3 this was uh just to set some, briefly some context, this is Jesus' high priestly prayer. This is the prayer he's praying um, for him, himself, um, for his disciples, and then also for all who will believe him, him, in him later in those three ranks. Uh, first of all, he is praying, um, he is praying for um, his shared project or, or uh, purpose with the Father. John 17, 3, a classic fellowship statement and this is eternal life that they know you the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent yes that's eternal life knowing God knowing Christ and being known by him of course yeah can somebody read uh, 1 John 1 verses 1 to 4 let's start there 1 John 1 1 to 4 a beautiful uh, introduction to this epistle. Thank you, Monica, for grabbing some Bibles. Appreciate it. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared... We have seen it and testified to it, and we proclaim to we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and has appeared to us. We proclaim it to you which what we have seen and heard, so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and the Son Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. Thank you. So, as John writes. Uh, when we read scripture, we always listen for the that's or the so that's because they communicate purpose. John is very clear. We have relayed to you the person of Jesus Christ and what we have witnessed in fellowship with him. 
Why have we relayed this to you? What is the, what is the payoff? What is the end game, the end purpose? There's two in this passage. What are they? What did you hear? Yes. Um, God desires our joy. Our joy, yes. Isn't that nice? Isn't, that, isn't it wonderful to know that God wants us to have joy? And not be miserable. I, I like that. <laughs> That's a good thing. He may he may um, have a purpose for us to be miserable for a time, for his purposes, but that's not his end game for us. Joy in fellowship with him. What's the other purpose of that text? Well, his glory is the ultimate purpose, and we do see that in other texts. That's what we call the ultimate goal. Yeah? There is another goal specifically... Fellowship. Yeah, fellowship. With the Father and with each other. Yeah. He says that you may have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship together is with the Father and his Son, uh, Jesus Christ. Yeah. So there is the concept of communion, which sets us apart. God is capable of communion. We are capable of communion. I also love verse 7. Can somebody read verse 7 for us? Of that same passage, sorry. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Yeah. So the idea is if we are going to enjoy communion, going back to Adam and Eve, we got to get out of the bushes, right? Got to come out in the light, because that's where it happens. All the barriers are removed. We deal with the stuff, the crud that breaks communion and fellowship. We deal with it and we're restored to it. Going way back to the time where God came walking and said, hello, where are you? <laughs> Let's get back to this place. Beautiful. It's our purpose. All right. Well, we've gotten through one so far. We're not going to get too far tonight. Communion. Let's move on to communication. Actually, kind of these overlap. We've been talking a lot about communication as we've spoken about communion. So we don't necessarily need to spend a lot of time here, but there are a couple of di dimensions to communication um, we want to think about, um, particularly how w when we think about the function of rule, right? God made us rulers of the earth. Part of rule, part of the power to rule is the power of language. Language is power, right? Knowledge is power. Words are power. So think about, can you give, you, we obviously know um, God, creation is presented to us as God speaking. He says, and it is. And this, this theme of the, um, the, the you, we see the power of the sovereign in the power of his speech. The more, uh, the more we see that what you say happens, the more power you have in Scripture. And we see that throughout you know, God, Jesus Christ's power to speak and raise the dead to life, right? Now, let's think about uh, how we, in this sense, we reflect God. Just give examples of how human speech has power. It can be like God. It can be positive power. It can be negative power. Just give examples of human speech has power, whether it's in writing or spoken. Maybe think of texts or documents that have held great power that have unleashed, that have had, that have had great um, impact in history. Give examples. Speech has power. And with power comes responsibility, right? Hundred percent. And you can slap somebody and punch them out immediately. Mm -hmm. Some reason it stays with them. Absolutely. Scripture sometimes it's a You wonder sometimes if we really stopped and thought about the power of our words, particularly as parents. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's good. It's a good reminder. Florence. Words have been very powerful in history when you have a, a Churchill and a Hitler both hmm. speaking. Um, so the, the cons consequences of their talk are, you know, can't even measure it, but what, what happened uh, as a consequence of Hitler's talk uh, led to tr horrendous numbers of death and, and mm. suffering, whereas Hitler, uh, uh, Churchill's Churchill. uh, courage encouraged many, many people to just continue the fight and not give up. The power of oratory in both directions. That's from the same war, that's a good example. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. The power of those ten words. Mm-hmm. In culture. It's good. Anybody else? The power of words. Examples. The power of human speech. I think it's really interesting that when Jesus was on the cross, he said it was finished. Mm. It was finished by his death, but he made it final with his words. Spoke it. It's good. Mm-hmm. Uh, my freshmen are conducting interviews this week, and we've been talking about the power of a question mm. and how it connects you to a person. And I think of just questions that can be really harmful, like, why do you look like that? Or why do you, you know, like, that can be really damaging. But how questions can also open a door, to, like, how are you really doing today? And then how that can connect you to somebody. I love it. And that connects with communion, the power of the question. I always think of in the power of the question how Jonah ends, the book of Jonah ends with God asking Jonah a question. Hmm. Like, do you do well to be angry? He has often asked me that. <laughs> and the answer is almost always no. <laughs> Ooh, and I love, yes, because the question can be a scalpel. It can feel destructive because it can, it can cut you to the heart. And yet it brings life. I, Jesus, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> yes, that's good. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, let's just read a couple verses about the power of communication. Um, somebody could look at Proverbs 12, 18. I mean, there's so many, so many verses or scriptures about it. But there's a couple that are just worth chewing on here for a few moments. Got it, Adamina? Thank you. The words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Boom. That's what you were talking about, Patrick. Plain and simple. 18 verse Yes, the power of life and death. Ephesians 4.29. no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. Mm -hmm. And that's talking specifically about our use of words in covenant community. That's the context in which those words are written. <laughs> yeah. Very basic, but fundamental. You know, I think about, too, the power of words to cast vision. It can be a biblical vision or an unbiblical vision. Uh, Revelation 21 and 22 cast a vision that can put us on our feet and 
move us in a direction. But I think, too, I think one of the most powerful speeches in our nation's history that did that was Martin Luther King's I Have a Dream speech. I mean, it wasn't very long, that speech, but some of the themes of that speech, he cast a vision, um, they just, they, they, they have constantly come up in further discourse, in further writing, in further, right? It's just, it's one of those touchstone speeches that people keep going back to. And um, the ability to cast a biblical vision and paint a picture and make people's mouths water is a powerful use of language. He was trying to bring all the rich together. Yes, he was. Absolutely. And and we see some powerful language in scripture that does the same thing, that casts the same kind of vision. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. Um, we may not get through the next anybody or anybody else to communication. Anybody else have something you want to say? Yeah, Florence. I think in this context, the silence is golden. So at times, you know, it's better to just not say anything. Uh, and especially with the social media today, <laughs> you'd be better off sometimes just keeping silent. Whew. The economy of words. Words, words are powerful when there are sufficient silences in between and when they are judiciously spoken, which if you, you know, it's interesting. We talk about communication. We have focused on speech. But you brought up the whole other side. What's the whole other side of communication? You're speaking and? Okay, writing. That's good. That, that's, that's, that's one. Yep. I was, I was thinking in a different direction. Listening, right? Who's, I don't know who said it, but you know, God gave us two ears and one mouth. Right? So we listen twice as much as we speak. And listening is a powerful form of communication, isn't it? How many times in the Psalms do we not read about the God who hears? He speaks. We read a lot, especially for those who are in distress, about the God who hears. Yep. <laughs> That's right. Now you listen up. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. That's beautiful. And so both are, are very important parts of communication. Being teachable, having a listening spirit, because that will form the content of what I speak as well. Hmm. All right. Anybody else? To communication. Communion, communication is what makes us unique in the image of God. Ed. Yes. Amen. Communicate. You know, you talk about lying, deceiving, murder. Um, John, in John, Jesus, John 8, right? Jesus, he, in one text, he calls Satan the father of lies and also a murderer. And it's interesting, isn't it interesting that we even have one commandment that's specifically focused on speech? Uh, the power of speech to either destroy or to build. Yeah, that ninth commandment. Mm -hmm. With our thinking, we create thoughts and communication. We transfer them from one to another. That's right. That, that It is very much connected with our ability to think and reason, which is part of the, the image of God. Yeah. All right, well, we are basically out of time. I know the, the other uh, folks will be coming out soon. Next week, if you want to just advance the slide, we are going to talk about character, um, how we are in character, we are made to reflect God, which brings us back to, I think it was probably already a year and a half ago that we hit the first parts of the Westminster Shorter and we talked about the attributes of God. This is going to touch us right back because there are, what do we call them? The communicable attributes, the um, attributes that we share with God. Um, so we're going to get into those. And then Tyler, if you could advance the next slide. We're going to talk about character. We're going to talk about crown. What does it mean? We're going to look specifically at the sequence, the fascinating sequence given in Genesis 1 to verse 28. And the end of that sequence, the end goal of that sequence is um, to subdue the entire earth. What does that mean? What does that look like? What does that look like um, in terms of its created goodness? What does that look like as fallen? 
Um, we're going to talk about that. And then the next slide, Tyler, we're going to talk about creativity. Um, we can talk for a long time about creativity. Um, that's one of the wonderful ways that we resemble God. Uh, the God who creates from nothing. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. In Hebrew, there is a word that always means, in a certain form of the verb, that always means create from nothing. It's bara. And it is used exclusively of God. But there are other words for create, like, um, that mean to form. And that we share with God. And he makes the raw materials. We take the raw materials and we continue. We are actually co-creators. We continue the process of creation. In a sense, creation isn't done yet. God made the original creation, rested, entered communion with us, and now we continue the process of creation. You ever thought of it that way? And in a sense, and, and our, you know, the creative work we do is actually going to be part of the finished work of creation and the new creation. It's pretty, it's pretty cool when you think about it. All right, but I'm getting ahead of myself. And the last one, very much related to creativity, is cultivation. We're going to talk about, I love that word cultivation. Uh, let's just stop right here and think about what, what other English words sound like cultivation. Culture, right? The concepts of culture and cultivation are very closely linked as we think about that. So, and here come the, here come the troops. So um, we are going to finish for tonight. And I'm going to ask Chris, will you close in prayer for us this evening? Thank you. Lord of creation, um, we take a moment to praise you and thank you that you have made us in your image and that we have been invited into perfect communion with you. Mm -hmm. Lord, thank you that um, you have invited us into that and that we are um, experiencing that even now together as we fellowship with one another and commune with one another. Lord, continue to teach us um, and encourage us and lead us and give us our daily bread each day, especially as we look out to a new week. Let us be refreshed from this day of worship um, and let our lives glorify you as we enter into Monday. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.